All right. Uh, hello, class. Uh, let me adjust my mic volume a little bit. There we go. Um, hi there. So uh, we're going to get started here. Um, hello. So we're going to get started here. Uh, so first, welcome to the online class. I'm going to briefly summarize uh, some of the changes uh, coming out of the gate. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump uh, straight into that. So uh, let me pad that left side just a little bit property no. one second sorry working on the uh working on the crop here there we go there it, that looks nice so oops oops all right um so welcome back sorry that this didn't get up yesterday just uh you can tell i have clothes on the bookshelf behind me so i'm still in the process of moving so i should be done tomorrow so next week we'll go off without a hitch uh so apologies that this is late um but just jumping straight into some of the changes so i want to before we jump into java fx take a bit of time and talk about uh and by the way i apologize for the lighting quality i you know, maybe i can help a little bit that might help a little bit but yeah it, it this this won't be a problem uh next week once i once i move but there's a window behind me so it's gonna throw off the video quality a bit but let's go ahead and just jump straight into uh, some of the changes that are going to happen with the course going online so i'm going to move my face up here um by the way if you have questions at any point uh please just post in chat uh and i will try to respond to those questions then um so first, all the information about going online will be in the Piazza Master Thread. Uh, right now, I know there's no exam information there, but that is um, that is under construction. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with that yet. Yes, POG indeed. Um, the lecture will still be, other than today, Tuesday, Thursday, 1230 to 145 uh, at this Twitch channel. Uh, again, the lectures will be recorded. I will both uh, upload them to YouTube. Additionally, uh, I will be uh, making sure I set up Twitch so it stores the VOD of this. So that way you can come back and watch it here as well and see the chat. Uh, the chat won't be carried over to, uh, to YouTube, uh, obviously. Uh, all lecture materials are still on Colab. So if you check Colab today, you'll see... Um, You'll see that I've already uploaded all the code examples as well as the slide. Uh, I'm going to build some of these code examples from scratch just to walk you through the process of JavaFX. But I just want you to know this part of the class still isn't going to change. Everything's still going to be on Colab, including my source code. I kind of pride myself on my ability to, to make sure that all the material's up. So, so don't expect that to change. Um, Oops, sorry, I'm on the, the wrong uh, window here. That was the PDF file. Um, homework for due date has been pushed back to March 27th. So originally it was due next Monday, which was the 23rd. Obviously, we lost a week of office hours while we were scrambling to kind of figure out how we're going to do all our classes online. Uh, so that will be due now Friday, March 27th. Um, that said, uh, it won't be pushed back further and we're going to talk about how really I'm, I'm kind of out of flexibility with homework assignment due dates. So I'm going to show you uh, eventually all of the homework assignment due dates here in a couple slides. But uh, that has been pushed back. We will still have office hours next week. Uh, so do get started on that if you haven't. Uh, the schedule has been updated. So I'm just going to quickly pull that up on Colab. Uh, you can see that the schedule has been updated. I've removed one of these design pattern classes at the end um but that said uh we're still going to cover all the content so those design pattern lectures will just be a little bit more dense um the exam similarly has been pushed back the exam was originally next thursday but with us covering java fx uh today and next tuesday uh it didn't make sense to immediately jump into the exam i still want to do a review period especially since there's a lot of pretty important things that have been covered uh, since the first exam, software design principles, UML diagrams, etc. Um, any questions so far, just put them in chat. But uh, trying to do my best to keep this updated, as well as kind of keep an eye on chat as I'm able. 
Uh, exam 2, so now on March 31. Review not on March 24, sorry. That should say... Um, sorry, that should say March 26 is the review. So I'll just quickly correct that there. Um, homework 5 will be released uh, Monday of next week. So it'll be released before we finish our unit on Java FX. Start looking for a partner now. You can use Piazza uh, to help look for partners or um, you know any any discussion at all. Certainly, if you've made friends in the class, you're welcome to use them. It is a single uh, partner that you should have, so groups of two. I will allow groups of three, but they will have more requirements for the assignment. How will exams be administered? Um, I don't know yet, so I'm still working on that. I suspect CoLab, but um, I've already thought, how am I going to do... Uh, for example, UML diagrams. So one thing I may expect is that everyone has some type of camera phone that they can take a picture with uh, and that you would draw on a piece of paper, say a UML diagram, and take a picture. I'll work all that out by the exam review period, but I actually don't have all the details yet. Uh, it will be online, certainly, um, and I will have some policy in place to account for, for example, differences in time zones. I am not going to expect someone who is, uh, say, in Europe or Asia to take the exam at like three in the morning. Uh, I will have that planned out. I don't know how that will be done yet. You won't take pictures of you on cam. You will take uh, so you'll draw something on a piece of paper and take a picture of that as part of the exam. That's that's the that's the intent if that makes sense. Uh, because I, because CoLab doesn't support drawing. Um, and I, and I, and I will have drawing UML diagrams as certainly as part of exam two. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, you know, or, or you're not comfortable with that, certainly let me know and I'll, I'll try to figure out how I'm going to do this, but I admittedly don't know yet. Uh, but anyway, back to homework five. So, Preferably group of two. A group of three will be allowed, but you will have additional requirements. Um, certainly, I, I won't be taking pictures of any students, by the way. I, I, this is part of why I'm doing Twitch, is then students' video cameras don't, don't come up here at all. Um, So from there, working alone is strictly disallowed on homework five because we will be using Git. Part of it is learning how to work with another student. Um, office hours will be on Discord, so I'm going to show this in a second here. Um, sorry, I'm on the wrong Discord there. Uh, they, they, I actually do use Discord uh, conventionally for gaming, but I have this Discord server, which is linked uh, on the Piazza Mega thread. So this is where you will come in, and if you want office hours help, you'll come in during my office hours or during TA office hours, and you will, oh, let me jump into this voice channel. So you will jump into this voice channel. You'll then uh, just kind of post in general, like, hey, I need help with blank. I will then pull you down to a private room and talk to you, or a TA will pull you down to a private room and talk to you. Uh, so you will need to create this Discord account for office hours. The link is in uh, the Piazza master thread. Please download the desktop application because we will want to use a screen share uh, in order to help you work through your code. And um, we can't do that if uh, we can't do that if you are using the web. Uh, application web application doesn't support screen share desktop application does um again just post questions as you think of them certainly i know that everyone's gonna have to get used to using this figure it out um but it, it's fairly straightforward just basically short version is if you need help go into this discord and just sit and wait in the office hours sde i have some music if you want to listen to it while you wait you're welcome to do so uh any questions? All right. Finally, uh, here is the homework schedule going forward. And, and I have to stipulate ahead of time, this won't change. Um, so I won't be able to push back deadlines anymore. I, I've, I'm kind of out of time to do that. 
So first, homework five and seven will be pair. Uh, individual homework is, or homework six, excuse me, is an individual homework. You will be working alone. So this will be on databases. Uh, sorry, this should be, uh, this should be uh, three tier, not database. How are tests going to work? Uh, I don't know yet. So I'll actually talk about that uh, during the exam review. What I would expect is mostly on CoLab, um, but I may have you do things like draw a UML diagram on a piece of paper and take a picture of it and upload that picture. I may have to have you do something like that uh, during the exam. So I'm, I'm gonna have to figure that out. I actually don't have all the answers there yet. Um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, it, 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 we'll talk about that on the exam review period, which will be uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, March 26th. Uh, homework 7 is going to be another pair assignment. Again, if you have a triple, you will have extra features to implement. Um, homework 7, I will allow people to work alone if they so choose. Homework 5, I will not allow people to work alone. You're, you're going to have to find a partner. Uh, but homework 7, I'll allow you to work alone, but you'll have to do as much work as a pair. Um, so the way I'm going to do this, these due dates, again, cannot change. Please just get this into your mind now. These due dates cannot change. This due date is, um, so homework seven will be due April 28th, 2020. However, I will not mark it late if I receive it by the reading day after the exam. That means to say, this is the official due date but you won't lose points if you submit it. Um, sorry, this should be May 8. Uh, if you submit it by May 8, it will not be marked late. However, I will not accept your homework after May 8 for any reason. Um, so please be aware of that. Uh, if you submit May 9, it will be a zero. It won't be the 10% the penalty that is off. Um, oh, someone jumping into... Sorry, I'm still in Discord, silly me. Um, so do do be aware of that. There will be a quiz next Tuesday released on JavaFX material. Um, any questions about the homework dates or the upcoming homeworks, just go ahead and post them uh, in the chat there. Um, ask when the grades will be released for homework three and quiz five. Homework three grading has been delayed uh, because I haven't been able to finish the rubric yet. Uh, the, the grades for that uh, hopefully will be out before exam two. Uh, the I will, by the way, for homework four, I will release a solution before the exam uh, for homework four. Uh, it will not be graded before the exam, but I will release a solution after uh, after the deadline. Homework three and quiz five. So quiz five, I will try to grade. Uh, I, I, I'm being realistic when I say I can't do this weekend just because of everything that's going on. I'm still playing catch up. I will certainly have quiz five graded uh, before the exam review session on Thursday. Homework three, we will do our best to have graded before the exam. Um, but I admittedly, because of everything that has happened, I uh, remember homework three was due uh, before the, the spring break. And everything's just kind of gone crazy since then, so we haven't actually been able to finish. I apologies for that, uh, but we will get caught up. What happens if a student catches the virus? What would what would be expected of them? So, in that situation, um, first, do everything you can to not catch the virus. I I'm just pretty much almost legally obligated to say that at this point. Uh, I same as any injury or any illness. I will handle those on an ad hoc basis uh, for the for the individual student, but it but what I mean when I say those homework deadlines cannot change is that um, for the class I've pushed back homeworks now multiple times. I can't do that anymore. Um, I will say, however, that that May 8th deadline for the final homework is is pretty much non-negotiable because at that point I have to get final grades done. So I really can't um, push back uh, the, the May 8th deadline at all.
Uh, from there, just a note, and I, I only saw this news recently, and I don't exactly know how to assimilate it yet. Uh, my understanding is everyone by default is moving to credit, non-credit. Uh, you can then choose to switch the letter grade if you do so. I will do my best to make sure all the grades are on collab, uh, so you can make that decision for yourself. I think the deadline is April 28th, uh, so I would take into account how well you think you did on homework 7. Uh, into that decision. Any last questions just about procedure? I know I've spent about 15 minutes on this, but I want to make sure I can get uh, any questions in before I move into Java FX, because once I move into Java FX, I'm going to ask any questions about class procedure to be saved to the end of class. So that way I can get through the material. And certainly you can always ask these questions on Piazza as well. There's no, there's no problem there. All right, um, not seeing any questions, so I'm going to jump into Java FX. So, Java FX is a is a fairly robust GUI suite for Java. So that is GUI is graphic user interface, uh, spelled G-U-I, pronounced GUI, and a GUI is just a user interface that is beyond uh, command line or beyond, say, using a scanner. It's similar to Swing. So if you've ever worked with Swing before, uh, you should be fairly easy to translate that. That said, I, I don't expect that you've worked in Swing. I'm coming at this as though you haven't. So today I'm going to get started. I'm going to do some basic setup and some basic widgets and event handlers. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll get into kind of some more advanced design. So to get started, uh, I've created an empty project here. I've created an empty project, and the first thing that you'll need to know is that you need to download uh, Java FX. So if you notice, I have downloaded uh, Java FX here, um, and inside of this folder is the Java FX SDK, and specifically, we're interested in this lib folder. This lib folder, if you notice, contains lots of jars. These jars are what manage uh, Java FX. So we're going to rely on those uh, jars here. So when you download Java FX, uh, you then have to add that to a library. So because I'm creating a project here, I'm going to add it to the library, project structure, um, libraries, add, and I'm just going to browse to that folder, which is on my D drive. Java FX, specifically lib. That's the folder I'm adding. Notice it contains all the jar files. I'm just going to add the entire lib folder. And you'll see that that folder is now added. Uh, so this is like any other library we've added. Nothing new here. Uh, from there, I'm going to apply this. I'm going to get started, and I'm just going to produce a simple uh, hello world. So I created Java class, same as any other, and I'm going to call this, uh, hang on, let me check my notes here, what I called this. Uh, I'm just going to call this for now um, Java FX Demo. And I know you haven't had time to download it, but again, all the source code that I write uh, is already on the web. So if you'll notice on the web, there already is Java FX demo. So you can just copy that, but I want to show you and walk you through each line as a starting point. Um, now, in order to make a, a, a program, a Java FX program or a class, a Java FX program, we need to extend application and specifically application from Java FX application. Make sure you're picking this one and not any of the others. From there, you'll notice that it requires you to implement a method and that method is called uh, start. From here, all we need to do to uh, create this as a runnable class, we're gonna add a standard public static void main method. But we actually don't call start. The method that we call, and this may seem a bit strange that we're not calling start, we don't call it directly. Rather, the method we call is launch. And we can just pass our args to it. Uh, you don't actually necessarily need to pass the arguments unless you 
plan on using the command line arguments. From here, the start method is actually where our application runs. So first, before we jump into this, I want to discuss a little bit of terminology. So why are we bothering with a GUI? Why are we bothering with this? Well, the idea is we're really wanting to teach event handling. Uh, so while I'm using JavaFX as a means to teach event handling, I'm really more interested in the event handling. The idea is until now, most of your programs have been start at point A, proceed to point D, and just keep moving as quickly along the way as you can. But oftentimes we'll find a program where they need to wait for something, wait for an asynchronous event. That is an event that just isn't a sequence of code, but rather some external factor that affects the program. Um, so specifically with GUIs, we're talking about user inputs, but these, these events can be things other than user input, and we'll talk about that. So the event handling paradigm is that there's this main loop and it's and while this may seem computationally inefficient, uh, any event handling loop is designed to use uh, not a lot of processor time and generally be efficient. Uh, they, they recognize this. There's an invisible main loop. We don't have to write this as programmers, but there's an invisible main loop that sits and says, hey, has an event happened yet? Has an event happened yet? Has an event happened yet? And when it does happen, so, so like a kid in a car saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? When that event does happen, Java produces a thread, and that thread creates an independent stream of execution. You've, you've talked about threads and concurrency uh, in, your, in DSA. That thread will then perform some action based off whatever the event handler says to do. So an event is some asynchronous occurrence, uh, in our case specifically user input, uh, user clicking a button or hitting enter or whatever. And I swear I'm not holy. That's just the sun outside my window. Um, and that this handler uh, basically tells Java what to do with that event. So the action can be a mouse click, hovering, hitting enter. It can also be uh, things like, for example, uh, let's say you're doing an inst instant messaging program. Um, that instant messaging program is going to receive a signal from the server saying, hey, a new message has arrived. You need to download it and display it to the user. That would be another example of event handling that isn't related to user input. Another, you could actually have um, uh, periodic events. So something like at midnight every day, do X. At every hour on the hour, do this. Every second, do this. Whatever. Uh, that is also something that is done through event handling. So again, while we're focusing on GUI, just understand that this, this event handling paradigm does not require a GUI. So uh, we're gonna cover these things. I know I've gotten away from the code for a bit, but we're gonna talk about pane, scene, and stage first. And then we'll talk about some basic widgets here. Uh, I have demos with all three of these widgets. So, uh, the I, we'll talk about these virtual machine modules in a second. The the basic idea of a GUI is that your window, so this window, for example, this this PowerPoint window is a stage, and on this stage, I have a scene. Currently, my scene is to display uh, PowerPoint slides, and if you look, you'll see on the left of the scene, I have these options picked. I have a scene here in uh, IntelliJ right now. This scene is, I have a package explorer on the left, and then in the center I have my editor pane. That's the idea. Uh, and, and each stage has one scene at a time. So like a play, you don't have multiple plays going on at the same time. But each scene can have disparate parts. That is, uh, again, going back to PowerPoint, you can see that I have a pane on the left which shows uh, slide previews. I have a pane up on top, which shows various options. And I have a pane here where my current slide is viewable. So think of it as a hierarchy of at the bottom, we have a stage. We have multiple scenes possible, although all the examples today are only one scene, but we're going to show one scene at a time. And that scene contains a one or more panes. Those panes then contain individual widgets, so buttons or labels or text areas or form fields, whatever. But at root is our stage. And so 
The stage is the whole window. A particular scene, a particular presentation of the application will be a scene. We show one scene at a time. That scene contains one or more panes. Those panes contain one or more widgets. Uh, and we'll talk about applications with more than one scene uh, on, on Tuesday. Uh, but for now, we're just going to start with the basics. So going back to this, we now already have defined this thing called stage. And this is the method I inherited. By the way, you don't actually need this throws exception. I don't know why it forces you to, uh, it, it requires, it puts it there for you. It doesn't force you to have it. You can delete it. Um, but for now, this is our starting point. This method start gets called by launch, but launch also sets up all the other fields that we need. So launch does a lot more work than just um, displaying the GUI. It actually primes the memory, creates the window, all that. It does that so we don't have to. And the last thing that launch does is it calls the start method. Well, technically the last thing it does is it then waits for user input, but that's that's a separate thing. So from there, the first thing we want to do, we're just going to do a, a kind of a simple uh, Hello World style program here, is we are going to uh, just quickly create uh, a widget. We're going to create a label widget. Now, label is just text that a user cannot interact with. Uh, so it's useful for just like displaying instructions or something. Uh, so we're going to call this label text equals new label hello world, something like that. Now, you'll notice it doesn't know what label is yet, but we can import it. But here's the key. Do not import label from Java AWT. This is abstract window type. Instead, make sure you are importing label from Java scene control. Make sure that this is where you are importing label from. Uh, if you import label, uh, let me actually, sorry, let me make sure the whole window is visible. If you import label from Java AWT, this won't work. So make sure all of your import statements that relate to graphics are in Java FX packages. Uh, if they're not, delete them and then make sure that anything you need to re-import that you're importing it from Java FX. From there, now that we have this text widget, we need to add this widget uh, to a scene. And so I'm going to create, or first we need to add the widget, excuse me, uh, not to a scene, but to a pane. So I'm going to create a pane. This pane is going to be a flow pane. Uh, a flow pane is just a particular layout, and flow just means we're going to fit things wherever they fit. It's, uh, it's a great starting pane, but it doesn't really allow for any aesthetic decisions, but we're just getting started. So flow pane pane equals new flow pane, which admittedly sounds like uh, some early 2000s wrapper, nonetheless. Uh, we are then going to add the text widget to this pane. So the way that we add it, and this looks a bit confusing, but the way we're going to add it is we're going to do pane dot get children. This gets the list of widgets that have been added to the pane, which admittedly is currently empty, but we're going to add it dot add text. So this creates the label widget. This creates, sorry. This creates the pane we add the widget to. This, this adds the widget to the pane. Just to clarify uh, what each step along the way is. Will this lecture be available after stream ends? Absolutely. All my lectures will be. Uh, so I've already set up uh, Twitch to store the VOD uh, of every lecture I give. Uh, on Twitch. Additionally, I am independently recording this and will be uploading to YouTube. Uh, and, and my YouTube channel is linked in the Piazza Master thread. So you'll you'll be able to watch it through either median. I personally would actually recommend Twitch because you will then see the questions student asked. Uh, you won't see the questions students asked uh, on YouTube because that's not incorporated into the recording. Uh, good question. And again, all of this source code is already uploaded on Colab. Uh, if you take a look at Colab under resources, uh, you will see 320 JavaFX part one. 
literally all the widgets I'm going to go over today are already here. So now we've added uh, this to the pane. The next step, though, is we need to add this pane to a scene, and then we need to set what scene we are looking at. So I'm going to create scene S equals uh, new scene, and I'm actually going to specify both the pane that is in this scene as well as the size of this scene. So let's say 300 pixels wide by 200 pixels tall, something like this. I make sure I import JavaFX scene, scene.scene. .scene. Now that I have this scene, which this creates the scene and adds the, the flow pane we just created to it. Now I need to set the scene of my stage to be this new scene. So stage.setScene S. The last thing I need to do is stage.show. Now I cannot run this program yet. There's one last thing I'm going to have to do, and this is a little bit of an annoyance, so I apologize, but this is how JavaFX works. If I try to run this program right now, so I try to run JavaFX demo, it's actually going to give me uh, JavaFX runtime components are missing. You need to add uh, some virtual uh, machine arguments here. So we've done that before. If you remember when we added dash EA for enable assertion errors, uh, this was when we were doing testing uh, with JUnit with you know, where we wanted assertion errors to actually crash the program. Uh, we're going to do that in another way. So if you look at these slides, I have now, um, specifically we're looking at this portion down here, and I'll, I'll move this banner for a second so you can actually see everything. Oh, wrong, nope, sorry. Online class, everyone, hey, all right. So from there, you can just mostly copy and paste this um, to the virtual arguments, but I want to show you one additional step. So first, I'm just going to copy this module path and add modules command. I'm going to go into edit configurations, and in VM options, I'm going to paste that. But this statement, path to JavaFX lib folder, actually is not a variable that exists. Uh, so just first to show you... Um, this variable doesn't exist. I haven't defined it. So I need to replace this with the path to my lib folder. So even though we've added the library uh, manually to the project, we then have to tell Java where to find that library at runtime. And yes, that is a bit annoying, uh, but this is something you've had to do since Java 10 for JavaFX. So from there, I go to my lib folder. And if you're in Windows, um, you can actually just, whoops, go back. You can actually just click at the end of this address bar and this will give you the folder. Um, or you can you know, do this similarly in the Mac, but get the path to the folder, the absolute path. From there, I just copy and paste in my absolute path. I'm then gonna hit okay. So just to make sure everyone saw that, now you'll notice my path is here. Uh, again, the format of this command line, it's in the slide, module path, add modules. This part will never change uh, for now. Uh, we will talk about when we want to add uh, other features, uh, when we want to be able to design a scene with a UI, because JavaFX has a UI that lets you design scenes, but we're not there yet. Um, so now that I have this path in place, I'm going to hit OK. And now when I run the program, you will see that, hey, look at this. We have our little application. It's not particularly good yet. It just says, hello world, but it has a window. We can maximize it and minimize it. But it's our window, so we're, we're proud of it. From there, just some additional things. Notice there's no title to this window. If you want to add a title to the window, you can do that with stage.setTitle. Hello world, something like that. 
And when I run this program now, oops. Well, after I add a semicolon, when I run this program now, you'll see that I now have a title here. So this is kind of our starting point. Uh, if there are any questions so far, please feel free to just chime in. Uh, labels are not a very robust field. They're pretty much just for displaying text. But we can um, change the text to be whatever we want. You can even add line breaks. Hello world slash n. Hear, oh, hear the song that we're singing. This is a Partridge Family reference, and even I'm too young for that reference. So if you don't get it, don't worry. But you can do slash n, and that's going to give you um, line breaks like you would expect. Um, there's also some font options and stuff that we'll get to later, uh, or at least we'll we'll start demoing color later. But uh, that's something that I'll encourage you to look up on your own. But um, this is the starting point. So e this is kind of the bare minimum of what you need for a GUI. You need a stage. You need a scene. You need widgets. And you need to add those widgets to a pane and then add that pane to a scene. Any questions so far? And by the way, you can create multiple scenes and switch between them, and we'll, we'll, we'll come up with practical examples of that uh, for Tuesday, but we're not going to get to that today. So while maybe some... There we go. Uh, I remember I tried using Java Swing before, but it didn't work, and I had to use BR. Uh, so, so Java Swing does actually use like HTML tags in their labels, um, and that's one of the reasons that we're using JavaFX, is because Swing is... Swing is more dated than my Partridge family reference here, in my opinion. Uh, Swing is, is kind of out of date. And and if I have any 2110 students uh, watching this, you're probably like, well, then why are you teaching Swing in 2110? And I totally get the anger. It's because I haven't had enough time to uh, port this to a class of 600 students yet. It's much easier to demo this with a class of 60 to 70. Um but yeah, you, with, with Java uh, FX, now there are places where you can use HTML. Uh, the the text style stuff is kind of HTML-ish, and we'll take a look at that uh, when we get to it. But technically, the root of Java FX is actually not HTML, it's XML, uh, which makes it a bit more versatile. And by the way, we will talk about XML in this class uh, uh, fairly soon. You can see it on the schedule. All right. So now let's go ahead and create another uh, class. And this time we're, we're going to be ambitious. We're going to do some buttons. So I'm just going to, for now, uh, let's say we create a class called Don't Touch the Button. And I'm actually just going to copy and paste some code here uh, from my notes into this to get us started. Give me one second. Okay. Um, so this is the don't touch the button app. And I just want to show you quickly what that looks like. And then we're actually going to reverse engineer it. That is build it from scratch. So first um, we're going to edit configurations i'm going to create a new run configuration that just runs like an application i'm going to call this don't touch the button and then i'm just going to copy and paste the same uh so if you if you remember these vm options i'm going to copy and paste the same vm options and i'm going to pick the don't touch up the button main class so you don't need to customize uh, the, the VM options, you can just use the same ones uh, for each class if you have multiple applications. Again, we'll talk about when we might need to customize on Tuesday, but we're not getting that far today. So first, I have the same main. I have the same set title, don't touch the button. I create a label here. I'm going to talk about this placeholder label in just a second. For now, ex ignore it. But now I've created a button, and I want to show you uh, what that button looks like. And I'm going to comment out this line of code for now. This button is just a clickable button 
that will appear as a widget. For now, I'm adding it to the root pane, and this is what it looks like. So you'll see I have a button here. And right now it doesn't do anything when I click it, but this is uh, the button. From there, I now need to define, well, what happens when I define that button? And so this is where I create an event handler. So I've created an event handler class. And what this event handler class does is it has a single method. So this is a SAM, which means we can use Lambda bodies if we want. Um, like it's a single abstract method interface. Remember, we talked about SAMs before. This class is named button handler. It implements the event handler interface, and that interface has a single method called handle, which takes in an action event. And very often we won't use this, though I will show an example of where we use that action event uh, later today. I just won't cover it for now. From there, I'm going to set that placeholder label because notice the placeholder label is defined as an instance variable. This means it's global in scope. So while I initiate it here, I'm actually modifying it down here. And then I can set the text color of the label to red and then it will print, oh my God, why would you do this? There's so much blood. Because after all, the program is called don't touch the button. Why would you touch the button? Now I've defined this button handler. This is what will happen when I hit the button. Java will create a thread and it will set the placeholder label visible. It will set its text color to red and then it will change the text to, oh my God, why would you do this? There's so much blood. <laughs> I know I'm a child. Anyway, um, from there, in order to make the button actually do this, we have to use the function on the button instance called set on action. This takes in a single event handler. So notice when I type this button dot set on action, it takes in an event handler. And this event handler is going to be a new button handler, which is the, the class down here below, button handler. Let me see if I can get them both on the screen at the same time. So I'm just gonna create a new instance of this and that's what I'm going to pass. From there, I create a flow pane. I add all three buttons, text button and play, or all three widgets, excuse me, text button and placeholder to this pane. I then set the stage to that pane, 300 by 200. I then say stage.show, which again is always the last step. From there, I'm going to run this program. And just to show you, when I hit the button, oh my God, why would you do this? There's so much blood, which this is a reference uh, to an XKCD comic. Now, one thing I want to be clear about the flow pane. Flow pane works by just fitting things wherever they fit. Uh, so it, it works top to bottom, left to right. It just adds widgets as you go. What this means is and when I resize my window, notice that things will move. Also, things can get cut off. Um, so the flow pane is not really good for large applications with a lot of different features. But today we're just getting started with Java FX. So I want to start with a flow pane because it is by far the easiest to use. You just add things to it. You don't have to worry about how they're added. By the way, rather than have three lines of code like this, I can replace this with root.getchildren dot add all and this add all takes in multiple arguments text button and uh what was that called placeholder to be clear the order that i add these matters so for example if i move a uh, button before text so let's say i change this to button and i change this to text you'll see that now the button comes before the text. Whatever you do, don't touch this button. There you go. So this is the basis of an event handler. This is key. We have a single method, and this method is what we call when we want to do something. Uh, I'll give a minute for anyone to type in any questions while I take a drink, because it's, it's really hot in my room right now.
and again, this code is already uploaded, so you can you can see it on on, on CodeLab. All right. So from there, let's take a look at another simple button-based application. I'm going to create a counter. And so the way to think of this uh, program is, if you've ever seen one of those little uh, like th devices where it's just a button and it's a number that displays, and every time you hit the button, it increments that number, we're going to do that here uh, in, in JavaFX. Um, so with that, I have the counter program here. First thing I need to do, again, is we're going to create a new run configuration. Counter. It's going to run as its main class counter. We're going to paste the same VM options as we did with the others. Uh, hang on. Um, one second. JavaFX was very small for me, so I added... Yes, this is great. Thank you uh, for this much. Um, so, for example, let me just show that. Um, so the the uh to the environment variables. Okay, this is great. Thank you for sharing that. So if you have if you're finding that your your UI is too small, um modj 007 or 007, I I guess uh James Bond reference I'm assuming, which if so, awesome. Um you can simply add gdk scale equals 2. And I'm going to use that to don't touch the button. And when I run don't touch the button, you'll see, uh, oh, did I type that correctly? Let me try to increase the scale even more, see if it's noticeable. Did I type that right? If you're seeing any obvious mistakes, certainly let me know. Might be an Ubuntu thing. Oh, it might be. I'll figure out how to do this on Windows, and I'll cover it on Tuesday. Um, let's see if environment variables. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to figure out the scale. Um, probably shouldn't be showing off all my environment variables. Anyway, yes, I was running don't touch the button. Yes, so I, I'm... I'm this could be something where it's just not compatible with Windows. There's a way to do it, and I'll figure it out and show it on Tuesday. Um, anyway. So counter program, just to show you what it does, first and foremost. It's pretty straightforward. You press the button, it increments the counter. Uh, that's, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, from there, how does this actually work? So to do this... Again, same same setup. We set our title, same as before. We have a label counter, press the button to increment the counter. I'm then defining, and I'll show why I'm doing an atomic integer in a second. I'm then defining a variable to keep track of my current count. I then define my button. I then define my flow pane. I also have um, a count label. This label just keeps track of the count. And then I add all of these. I'll talk about this in a second. But uh, I add all these to a pane. I add that pane to a scene. And then I show the stage. So the way this works, here is my action listener. If you'll notice, it's defined by a lambda body. Now, it would be completely fine for me to do the following. Counter button equals uh or counter button dot set on action new event handler action event and then it is uh gotta remind myself public void handle handle action event e And then just use the same code.
Um, oh, I accidentally have too many parentheses there. That's why. Just use the same code. And then here we go. You see that this is an abstract, or a, excuse me, an anonymous class. So we've talked about before how we can have named inner classes. Uh, we can have external classes, of course, but named inner classes. We can replace those with anonymous classes, but also we can replace those with Lambda bodies uh, when they are specifically a SAM. Um, so in this case, because this is a SAM, you can replace it with a Lambda body. The, the reason, now you may be thinking, why don't I just do int count equals zero? And in this case, this would actually work uh, fine. The only difference is I would just say count plus equals one and replace this with just count. The problem is um, I would somehow need to pass the count. So now count has to be a global variable. Also with Lambda bodies, you can only use final variables, uh, but you can get away with that by using this atomic integer class. The only difference is rather than using plus equals, you use increment and get. And even though we don't use the get side of that, you still use the function increment and get. Uh, there's also add and get, etc. cetera. Um, but so all this does is this increments my count number by one. It then changes the count label to instead say count zero to be count whatever count is. Uh, so every time I hit this, it does that. Now, uh, it doesn't like something here. What did I... Oh, forgot the parenthesis. So this is an, uh, an anonymous class, but I can replace this with a lambda body, which again takes in an event, but I don't actually do anything with it. I then use brackets because I have multiple lines of code and I define it that way. So this is a useful way to just quickly define uh, an event handler. Uh, as, as a note, I do have um, auto moderation here. So I, I'm sure you thought it was hilarious to try to type something uh, inappropriate for class, but this is a real classroom. Um, so don't do that again. Thank you. Um, and no, no one in chat saw it. So it really wasn't funny. You just wasted everyone's time. Uh, isn't the body of the handle function outside the scope of your main? How can it reference the count variable? So the reason it can reference the count variable is because the class, the, it is an inner class inside of the function start. So all the variables that are in start are accessible within this inner class. Um, the reason that was different with don't touch the button is because I defined the class outside of the scope of my start function. So notice here's the start function scope, button handler was outside of that. But in this case, I, I'm defining the class inside of the scope of this function. And as a result, uh, the count function is there. Or excuse me, the count variable, not the count function, the count variable is there, forgive me. Uh, any other questions? And again, this code already uploaded. You can see it. Uh, this H gap, I want to be clear what this H gap is. Um, if you'll notice in this application, there's some nice pleasant space between the button and the labels. Uh, whereas if we go back to don't touch my button, you'll see that there's basically no space between the button and the label. Uh, this H gap produces horizontal gaps between any widget. And so this is a number of pixels difference. So for example, I can have 20 pixels in the gap and notice now there's even more space. V gap is used for if the widgets end up on top of each other, how much space is between uh, different horizontal lines. So these are, these are again, just pretty simple ways to kind of add some spacing, make it look a bit more pleasing. Uh, more than just flow pane has this, uh, also grid pane, for example, has H gap and V gap. And we'll talk about uh, grid pane in just a second. From there, I want to show the uh, square root calculator because I wanna show um, actually a text field. 
So I'm going to create another new class, square root calculator is going to allow the user to specify a number and then calculate uh, the, the square root. So this again is already uploaded on the web. You can find it there. From there, I define in the global scope a text field input and a label result. In this case, I'm doing a separate class. And the reason I do a separate class here is that there's enough code uh, to this particular event handler. While I could put it inside a start and there's nothing preventing me from doing that, just stylistically, I think it makes the code easier to read if the event handler is out here. Again, from a syntax standpoint and from a grading standpoint, I don't really care. Uh, this is just my preference. But here we have uh, a label that says enter a number. We have this thing called a text field. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. We have a result field, which is uh, initially invisible. We have a button called calculate, which calls, uh, which calls the button handler handle function whenever it's triggered. And then we add all these to a flow pane. So just to show you uh, what this looks like, add a new run configuration, call this SQRT calculator. Oops, I accidentally changed, uh, I changed an existing, and I didn't mean to do that. I changed an existing run configuration. I meant to add a new one. Uh, square root, calculator main class square root calculator we're going to take in the same options apply we're then going to run this square root calculator and you'll see that this enables me to enter a number such as 25 and it produces the square root 144 uh, 27 you get the idea uh, the way this works is the text field widget is this widget right here. And by the way, you can change the size of it and you can add different restrictions. And uh, there's actually, we'll show you uh, on Tuesday, the scene designer, which will let you actually specify things like password fields, where it will, when you type, like when you type a password field on a website, it replaces it all with, with uh, dot characters. But for now, just a simple text field, you can type anything, like banana in here. And the way this program works is once the user types in the text field and hits the button, the button first sets the result to visible, but then after that, it extracts the number the user enters uh, through double dot parse double from this field. So when I type 27, X takes on the value 27. We then calculate the square root, which in this case is 5.19, and we change the result to say answer, and then that square root number. Now, additionally, I have this try catch block to catch a number format exception. This is what happens when you type in something that can't be converted to a double, like banana. If someone types in something that's not a number, to prevent the program from crashing, I just say result set text invalid entry. Because I can't calculate what is the square root of banana. I, I don't know that answer. If someone has a really good punchline to that, uh, let me know. Because I'll, I'll put it in this program. Anyway, so this is now taking in text and uh, text field. And by the way, text area is pretty much the same as text field. Text area just allows for multiple line inputs. So all we need to do to get the text field is simply input.getText. And this returns a string. That string is whatever we type in this box. Um, and then from there, uh, and then from there, it's going to uh, The root of a banana has a circular... I need to stop paying attention to chat because uh, I'm going to get distracted looking for the best punchline. Um, so from there, we use get text to get whatever the user has typed here. By the way, you can put action listeners on a text field 
uh, when they hit enter. I haven't done that, but I'll, I'll do an example of that on Tuesday. Any questions about the square root calculator class? And while, while I'm waiting for those questions, I'm going to go ahead and pull in the last class we're going to look today, which is color changer. Wait, wait, wait. Oh no, never mind. That was are those just characters or does like does Twitch chat support some form of LaTeX? I think those are just special characters. Anyway. If Twitch chat supports LaTeX, I'm gonna have okay, just Unicode. Alright. I was gonna say if Twitch chat starts supporting LaTeX, I'm I'm gonna start really being uh having fun with it. Anyway. Color changer. From there, copy and paste this code. Again, this code is already on Colab. You can take a look at it. Um, I'm going to create my run configurations. So, name, color, changer. And then I'm going to use, again, the same VM options. We need to have these in place. From here, I just want to, there's there's nothing new here. What I want to show you though is that when it comes to having action listeners for buttons, there's two choices. One is you have a one-to-one -one relationship. Every button has one, sorry, I'm trying to get the perspective of the camera here. Every button has one action uh, listener, or excuse me, one event handler. So trigger one button, it triggers a separate event handler than every other button. But you can actually have multiple buttons with the same event handler and still get meaningfully different results. And you may find that this is easier. Uh, for example, if you're doing, say, a grid of buttons. So like, for uh, for example, hypothetically, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, hint, hint, related to homework five, if you had to uh, click a grid of buttons that you don't write a separate button handler for each button, or excuse me, event handler for each button, but rather you have one and it finds which button that came from. So first I have, just to show you what this program does, all it is is red. If you hit the, if, if you hit the blue button, it changes to a blue background. Red changes to a red background. Yellow changes to a yellow background. Not too surprising a program, pretty straightforward. And the way that I could do this using the tools we've talked about so far is I could do this very simply with lambda bodies uh, in this way. So take in the event and then just set the root pane to be equal to uh, set style. And this is how you can change the background color, FX background color. Uh, and then it's, it's the standard RGB hexadecimal uh, color code. From there, when I run this, you'll see this program still works. And the idea here is that every button has a separate listener. The action listener on blue, excuse me, the vent handler uh, on blue, sorry, I'm, I'm used to teaching swing, so I keep saying action listener when I mean event handler, which they functionally serve the same purpose. Um, this just sets the roots background color to blue. This one sets it to red. This one sets it to green, or excuse me, to yellow, which is a combination of red and green. What I could also do, rather than having one different button listener for each, is I can do something like what I have above, where I define a single handler, and I add that handler to all three of these buttons. So let's take a look at how this color change handler class is defined. You'll see that it still implements event handler. It still has our handle function. But now I get the source of the action event. Now I want to be clear, this e.getSource returns type object. 
And that's because this action listener may not, or this event handler may not be coming from a button. It may be coming, for example, uh, from a text area. You can also do things like on hover or on click uh, on other fields, not just buttons or text areas. So I'm getting the source. That is whatever thing was activated that triggered this handle function. Because I know that this came from a button because that's the only thing I have in my program, I can just do a, what we would call an unsafe typecast a button. But if you want to make sure it's a button, you can always do something like if e uh, dot get source instance of button. And that would be... Uh, if you did it this way, this would be something of a safe type cast. In this case, I can be unsafe because I know the only thing I have in my program are buttons. So from there, I simply say, okay, if the source is my blue button, and notice I've defined, uh, wow, it is getting bright out. Sorry about the light. I swear this will get better. Uh, if... I have my blue button, yellow and red defined in the global scope so this inner class can access them. If the source is blue, and notice I use equals equals, that means are they literally the same memory address? Uh, which is which is actually what I want here. Did I actually click the blue button? Uh, source red, and then else I assume yellow. So this is the basis of how to do a color change handler uh, where you have one handler that reacts to multiple buttons. So for example, let's say you had a grid of buttons, say you were implementing some kind of board game, you could then just simply iterate through your 2D array of buttons, and if that address's button is the source, then you perform the same action on that button. Any questions? I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up lecture here uh, because we're, we're approaching time. Uh, so if there are any questions about how the class is going to be run online, by the way, I'm actually going to uh, w next week, I'll have a whiteboard set up. So I'll still be able to use the chalkboard like I did in class, uh, which, which is helpful for me. I hope it's helpful for you. But uh, are there any other questions that have uh, percolated in anyone's mind about uh, how the class is going to be run? Uh, now that we're kind of wrapping up here. And I'll, and I'll just sit here for a couple minutes and give you a chance to type questions. Or questions about today's material. That's, that's fine as well. <coughs> no, that's not a sponsorship, by the way. Uh, will you become a partner? Absolutely not. So I will not open up this channel to monetization because uh, that would be a huge conflict of interest. If someone, say, subscribe to the stream, does that potentially change how I view their grade? It doesn't for me. I absolutely would not be affected. But again, the perception of bias is, is just as bad as actual bias uh, sometimes. Are these lectures going to be posted on CoLab? Uh, they actually won't be posted on CoLab just because I'd have to download them and then re-upload them on Panopto. But they will be posted if you view the Piazza Master Thread. They will be posted on my Twitch channel. They'll be stored there permanently. I will also be uploading them to YouTube, although you will lose the chat uh, on YouTube. YouTube, there's no way to bring the chat from Twitch over easily without always having it on the screen, which is just something I don't want to do. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very much opposed to anything that could be perceived as conflict of interest, and I, and I also think it would be immoral if I, if I accepted money for doing my job that I'm already paid for doing. I, I would find that rather immoral. All right, uh, I'll sit here for another, let's say, three minutes. If I don't get any questions, I, I will kill the stream. But otherwise, you're free to go. And again, I'm not taking attendance, so don't worry about that.
Uh, will you stream games ever? I've actually thought about from this channel because I so so long diatribe here. Um, so one idea I've had is I know that students are not. It, it, it sucks to be in college and to be losing the social college experience um, when when you can't physically be in college anymore. So one idea I've had is just purely for fun, not required, is I thought about doing Jackbox party games strictly for my students. That is, I will only post the codes uh, on the P on the uh, class Piazza server, so that way only people from the class can join. I've thought about doing that. I'm not committing to it yet, um, but that would just be for fun. Uh, you would you would not be required to attend. It certainly would have no impact on your grade whatsoever. But if people would find it fun, I would do it. Uh, I do have a Twitch channel that I stream on, but I won't link it for the same reason I talked about before: con conflict of interest. I don't want people going to my Twitch channel and like thinking that liking or subscribing is somehow going to ingratiate them with me or anyone think that any student who does so is somehow getting a benefit so i so i won't be uh linking my actual twitch channel uh what games do i play uh for now let's do questions just about the class actually um i actually by the way if you want to go i had i answered that question last night so I did a, a, a kind of a, a warm-up lecture of how we're doing 2110. So you can just watch the last, like, five minutes of my lecture from last night. And I, and I kind of talk about all those things. I would obviously have to stipulate with the Jackbox Party game that I would ban people from the game the second they did anything offensive. Um, obviously, just, just because this is a college course. And, and so I have to make sure that this is, is handled uh, very professionally. Uh, thoughts on joining Pilot Minecraft? I haven't played Minecraft in like seven, eight years, something like that. I'm just not as much into it as I used to be. All right, well, I'm going to uh, end the lecture here again. All the code is uploaded. I will do everything in my power to upload every code example before class. That is to say that sometimes due to class lecture, I end up changing my examples, at which point I'll upload uh, the, the the finished versions. Uh, but, but certainly I will do everything I can to facilitate this online learning. Please don't uh, be afraid to contact me if you're having issues. I sincerely apologize that I didn't do this lecture at our usual time yesterday, but you know, you can see that box over there. You can. I'm in the process of moving. My room is normally not this bare, uh, so it's it's just been hectic from that end. Uh, but I will uh, have everything set up and ready to go by Tuesday. So with that, uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for for coming to lecture, and I will see you next time. Uh, take care.